Good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm not exactly sure what I'm doing among this group of great thinkers, but uh, hopefully I'll figure something out as we go along here. Uh, I'm going to keep my notes with me uh, because uh, Mihai said a couple of things that uh, have informed me about, I think, what I'd like to uh, point to uh, in my presentation here. And um, one of the first things that I, I suppose I should try to mention is that what Patrick said about how I was using streets in my neighborhood as a way to better understand uh, how the universe is put together uh, really grew out of my very deep interest in astronomy. And at the time I'm doing this on the street where I grew up, I'm only about, what, 10 years old or so, uh, but I had read enough about astronomy to understand some of the relationship between the Earth and the Sun and uh, I had a deep enough curiosity uh, that I would sort of formulate these ideas based on what I read. But I was also um, so deeply interested in this stuff that I just couldn't help myself but be the neighborhood nerd about these kinds of things. <laughs> And it's, you know, it's, it's just one of those things. Uh, one of the things I haven't really mentioned is that when there was a solar eclipse in the Philadelphia area, I think in 1965 or 66 or so, it came, it might have been a partial solar eclipse over Philadelphia, and I distinctly remember that day, in the summer I think it was, I collected as many pairs of sunglasses as I could and put them all together in sort of like this big mishmash of glasses over my eyes, so that I could observe this without any damaging effects. And it really, you know, it's again one of those things that really did identify me as this nerdy and strange kid who would do these weird kinds of things to follow this activity that nobody else in the neighborhood knew about. And the point I think I'm making about this is that I was willing to sacrifice uh, my, my character in the neighborhood for the sake of my pursuit of something that I found to be deeply interesting and deeply engaging and that I simply couldn't separate myself from. As a result of that, one of the things I think I've grown up with or I've seen to develop is an appreciation for how the universe is put together. Yes, I'm an astronomer, that's true. I'm also a geologist and it's partially because I'm, I'm so um, I, don't, I don't even know quite how to describe it. I'm uh, so sort of scattered, if you will, about where my interest in science really is. I love astronomy, and that's where my focus is, and I really like geology, but I'm so interested in the full realm of science, and it all falls into this thing about this love and appreciation for how the universe is put together. Physicists and others who understand some about physics get it that if you can understand uh, some of what's going on here in this room of how things are put together, the forces that help to make everything operate in the ways that they do, what happens when you let go of your bottle of water and it goes down to the floor, the forces and uh, 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 other matters that, keep, that put this material together, but then allow this kind of material to exist and then to allow the material in the here between us to exist. All of these things are not only deeply fascinating, but if you can understand them here, you can also understand what's going on at the very farthest reaches of the universe. And to me, this is a very powerful thing. Here I am at 14 years old, thinking about the fate of the universe. <laughs> How is it going to end? And I'm thinking this based on what I've read about the current understanding in 1965 or 19, uh, 1970 about what astrophysicists are thinking about what the fate of the universe is going, is going to be. Again, a, a deep reflection of, of how involved in this I am and how engaged in this I am. And today, this love of how it all works together. And so in my world, as I walk around in my world, I'm looking at how all of these things relate to each other. 
So I'm just as much interested in what's happening here with the materials that make up the room as I am in seeing phenomena of the daytime sky that other people may not recognize, or phenomena of the nighttime sky, or understanding how it is that Mars has water, so on and so forth, all these other kinds of things. Well, I mention all this stuff in this context because, um, against my better principles, I tend to work with kids a lot. No, I actually love working with kids, I'm only kidding. When one of the things that I see in kids is I see the same kind of curiosity. Uh, that's a word that really figures a great deal in my life, mostly partially because Benjamin Franklin was a very curious individual. I work at the Franklin Institute, but that's what I have. I have this curiosity for the world, the same way that kids have this curiosity for the world. But as Mihai pointed out, what often happens is this curiosity is beat out of kids to a great extent by some of our school systems around the country. And this is a really deeply disturbing thing for me, the state of, uh, of education in our systems, in our school systems these days. And the reason why is because I see too many kids that don't have the same kind of appreciation or even observing of the natural world as I did when I was a kid. And I, when I was a kid, I didn't have all the toys and things that kids have today. All of the things that would allow them to have much more information about the natural world right at their fingertips. All I had was, and some of you may remember this, when you went to the supermarket to shop for the week, at the cash register there was an encyclopedia that your parent could buy for 99 cents or $1.99. And I used to get those every couple of weeks, and I would read those things voraciously, and that's what informed my world. Kids today have so much more available to them, but they aren't deriving, to a great degree, I think, at least in what I see, the same kind of knowledge and appreciation about the natural world. Yes, many kids know every dinosaur name there is. And I take advantage of that because what I find is that not only do they know the names of the dinosaurs, but they also know all the names of the planets, every moon there is, all the names of the moons and the distances. I know this because they test me on it and they know better than I do what these things are. <laughs> but to me, this points out a really serious problem that we're going to have to deal with at some point in the future. If our kids are not learning well or not becoming good students, then this is going to pose a very big problem for us going forward into the future because, as you all know, these are the people who are going to be controlling our world. That's a scary thought uh, in and of itself right there, but it's the big denial for me that really bothers me about how much they aren't getting. I love to learn. I now love to learn. When I was a student in elementary school, you might not have known that from my grades, but I love to learn. I certainly love to read and learn how to read at an early age. I find that difficult for many kids these days to be able to read at the level that I was reading when I was in elementary school. It scares me. We should all be afraid of that because of the challenges that we have coming down the pike. It's a very serious issue. I'd love to talk about that with some folks uh, some more during the time here. Uh, but I think, one of the other, I think one of the things I mentioned in my little description of these t trends that we, uh, I'm paying attention to, we have to do something about the education system. We can't just observe it, but we have to do something. What to do? I'm not really sure. Why? Because it's a big enough problem. My fear is that, as I talk about when uh, I talk about some of the other uh, sort of projects that I think need to be affected in some way, in a great way, I think one of the things that should be done is we should just pull the pins on the hand grenades, throw them inside the room, slam the door, let them all explode, let it go down, and then sweep everything out and start over again. <laughs> Not so fast. <laughs> How? Can you imagine doing that? No. It's very difficult to, well, I can imagine it. It's very difficult, though, to imagine actually doing that. It's a big piece of the fabric of our society, but it's probably the most important piece of the fabric of our society, one of the most important things. And something radical like that needs to be done, and we need to engage that. We need to engage how big a radical change needs to take place in order for it to go forward. Education needs to evolve. And we need to allow that to happen, figure out a way for it to happen, and then engage it so it can. Okay, so that's one thing. Uh, on the far end, I'm going to come to the second point in just a moment, but on the far end, 
The other thing that I think about very often is where we are in science and technology in this country. And it sort of feeds back to this first piece. As you know, astronomy and space science is my big thing. Well, frankly, I'm worried. The concern about the American space program, many people think, has to do with these sort of, you know, nerdy scientist engineer guys who want to see astronauts floating in space all the time. And that's the basis of our space exploration program. Astronauts floating around in space. There's plenty of astronomical research and planetary research of a very, very high caliber going on that gives us tremendous information about this neighborhood of the solar system we live in. In fact, we no longer look for life, extraterrestrial life, somewhere else across the galaxy. We now look for it right here in our own backyard. We look for it on Mars. And the kind of work that's being done is incredible, absolutely incredible. However, one of the things I'm very concerned about are the other growing industrial nations. Why am I worried? Because they are developing their spacefaring capability at a much greater rate than we currently are. We're sort of there, but these other countries are showing their growing economic strength by displaying what they think is the greatest sort of talisman of this, and that is learning how to travel and work in space. Well, if we don't keep up with that, I think there's a big problem there. I'm not worried about astronauts floating in space. I love that idea, but the real issue about this is that if we lose our technological position in the world, that causes me a little bit of concern. Now, please, understand me. I'm not trying to be alarmist about this, not at all. But just think about it. What is this country's sort of positioning based on? Well, one of the things it's based on is our technological and engineering prowess. It's a very important piece of this. Don't mistake that it isn't. It really is. We can't let that go. But once one of the bases, one of the bases for having this strong technological, this great strength, it is how many engineers we have in the pipeline in our education system. We don't have enough. We don't have enough. So the big engineering countries in the United States are now very much concerned that they are going to have serious issues hiring engineers going into the future. My concern is that other countries see this too. And that could be an issue for us. Okay, now, uh, last is my third piece, if I can just get my microphone in the right place here. Great, um, let's see, can we go forward here? There we go. My third point is this one. Uh, I gave a presentation a little while ago called Science Galileo and the Rise of Science Denialism. We had an exhibition at the Franklin Institute about Galileo, this great Renaissance scientist, and my premise was that did science denialism actually come about much, much earlier than we uh, sort of are pointing to today? And what I mean by uh, science denialism is the tendency that I have, the growing tendency that I see for, a general public, uh, for our general public here in this country to sort of ignore the fact that there are real facts behind a lot of the science that's being brought to us today that says we must do something immediately about this situation because science fact says that it's true. I'll be, right, I'll be controversial right up front and say global warming. Global warming. Now, many people do not believe that global warming is actually going on. Yes, it is. And if you look at the hard science, you'll see that it's there that proves that that's going on. Why, don't, why isn't everyone up in arms about what can be done about this and actually doing it? So I gave this presentation, uh, let's see, there's Galileo versus, and religious iconoclast. And I pointed out because if you look at Galileo's work, what Galileo did was he went to the establishment of the time and said, guess what, folks? We have a problem that has to be fixed. It looks like it's not the Earth that's at the center of the solar system, but the Sun that's at the center of the solar system, and I have ab observational proof of this. And so what I need you to do is, I need you to change what the Bible says. <laughs> and I think we all know how well that went over. <laughs> not very well at all. But the fact is that he was right. He was absolutely correct. So I wanted to put this out there as a way to engage people about this idea of the challenges of science in our society and how we need to look at a better integration of science in everything that we do because it is going to take such a big place in the issues and problems that we have coming down the pike, not just for our society, but for the world as a whole. 
We have difficulties with hunger. We have difficulties with uh, illness and sickness and uh, medicine, medical di medicine distribution. All sorts of things like cl clean water. All of these different kinds of problems around the world, I'm not saying will be solved by science. I believe that community will play a big role in this too. But in the meantime, we have to look at why it is that we can't seem to get these things lined up. In Galileo's case, many people wanted to say that science and religion simply don't mix. There's always going to be a fight between science and religion because they are diametrically opposed to each other. No, they are not diametrically opposed to each other at all. And here's some of the things that I threw up just to sort of put everything together. The understanding of what faith is, what religion is, what belief is, where science is, and where denialism comes in. So in Galileo's time, as it worked out, the way it really was is that the Galileo's opponents in the Roman church completely understood his point. They completely understood his point. He'd had discussions with them for years beforehand about what it was he was trying to get them to understand, and they agreed. The issue was that they simply could not change what it was that the Bible said. They'd be undermining their own position if they did so. Is that part of what goes on in the world today, that maybe we undermine a position if we don't uh, change what we think is a, uh, a, a, a biblical ideology about something we understand in it completely uh, ignoring science fact? So here are some of the places where we see some of these issues. Genetic engineering is one. Uh, nuclear energy is another one. I think between the time I did this presentation, though, and now something's happened in Japan, we're all aware of that, right? Global warming, truth, or is it just a hoax? Well, we have all kinds of facts that tell us uh, what it is. And so, you know, familiar images that you know of about the uh, uh, issues around uh, nuclear power. I think that's it. Is that the last one I have? I think so. So uh, these are the things that are ever-present on my mind, and there is a theme that runs through all these things, and a lot of them have to do with science education. The world I work in all of the time informs me about the public's position in science education because I'm called on quite frequently to help people better understand science. And I do it on every level. I do it at the Science Museum where I work. I write a bunch of stuff. I do a lot of TV and radio and this, that, and the other. But what I'm struck by, absolutely stunned by, is the lack of basic science knowledge that people have. In astronomy, I'm stunned that people do not understand how it is or why it is that the moon has phases. People don't understand that planets can be easily seen in the night sky. Sure, I can get it that people are struggling with Brian Greene's string theory and that sort of thing. <laughs> Frankly, I'm struggling with Brian Greene's string theory. But there are just some basic things that I learned in elementary school, junior high school, so on and so forth, that I think everybody should have. So what I'm looking for is a basic level of science literacy that I think can inform a lot of these issues that I've spoken of so far, but I think that are also issues of tremendous deep importance for us. We must do something about how it is we educate our kids in this country. We must do something about that. And of course, higher ed has a great role to play in that because of the partnerships that can be developed. I also think that it's so deeply important that we talk about this issue of science denialism and try to figure out how we can engage with that and do something about that. And of course, on the back end of things, if we have kids coming through school with everything they need scientifically, if we can get the science literacy to a point, how does this then affect how our country, technologically speaking, continues to um, keep itself in a position where it is, and then how do we use those technologies uh, interactively with other countries around the world? Thank you.